Hello, welcome to the Friday, March 12, 2021 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Phishing, of course, is still going strong, and attackers are coming up with new ways uh, to present the user with malicious content. Of course, including it directly in the email often fails because of mail filters. More recently, we have seen it hackers use various cloud services, but those cloud services are also getting better in filtering uh, this content. So they have to keep coming up with new services to host malicious content. And according to a guest diary that was submitted by JB Bowers. We uh, do have a new service that's being used here, PictoChart. I actually didn't hear about it, but apparently it is a somewhat popular service that allows you to create infographics and distribute them among colleagues. Well, uh, these infographics are often distributed as PDFs, and that's what the attacker is abusing here. The PDF that they will offer via PictoChart is not an infographic, it's just a simple text document with a link that then links to the actual phishing site. And of course, they're claiming that in order to view whatever fancy infographics they offer, you first have to log into Outlook 365. And that's how they are stealing your Outlook 365 credentials. So overall, a pretty ingenious uh, use of uh, this uh, service. Uh, Not sure what uh, PictoChart can do about this other than uh, being more careful in filtering uh, content, maybe trying to proactively discover uh, these uh, phishing documents. And yes, uh, Microsoft Exchange, of course, uh, still a problem and uh, being exploited now by uh, multiple groups. uh, While we also get a little bit more detail about the actual exploits uh, being used, Praetorian uh, did publish a pretty detailed uh, blog post showing how these exploits work, including uh, proof of concept code. So if you want to dive into the details a little bit more, uh, that's a good uh, blog post uh, to uh, review. And of course, it wouldn't be InfoSec with a little bit additional trauma around this. Apparently, a proof of concept exploit was posted to GitHub. Now, GitHub is quite often used to uh, publish uh, this type of proof of concept code. But uh, unlike other exploits, this exploit was promptly removed. Of course, GitHub being owned by Microsoft may have done so in order uh, to protect uh, their products. And according to an article by Bleeping Computer, uh, some Windows 10 users are reporting that Windows 10 crashes after they applied the Microsoft March updates. Microsoft briefly removed uh, the relevant uh, patches uh, from Windows Update, but has since uh, published them again. So apparently uh, their uh, investigation didn't really find any correlation between uh, these patches and the crashes that users observed. appears to be a fairly small number of reports compared with uh, some past incidents uh, where uh, we had issues uh, with uh, Windows Updates. And McAfee did publish additional technical detail regarding the DNS vulnerability that Microsoft patched this week. And yes, it does require that you are able to authenticate an DNS update. So DNS updates have to be available and enabled uh, on the victim's DNS server. The vulnerability are relatively straightforward. Actually, if you're updating a text record and the length of the text record is larger than the length of the DNS message for DNS over TCP. Again, we do have a length field for the entire uh, DNS message and then a second length field for the actual uh, text record length. So if uh, those two length fields don't uh, match up, then you end up uh, with a classic buffer overflow. Well, it's Friday again. And uh, with me today, I have yet another sans.edu student, uh, Rob. Could you introduce yourself, please? 
Uh, yeah, my name is Rob Upchurch. Um, just finished up the SANS Core Engineering uh, Post Baccalaureate Certificate Program, and um, you know, been in the IT field going on about uh, 12 years now as far as enterprise security goes. So, uh, currently doing some work uh, on the side with my business and doing some work for a uh, hospital system out here in uh, Pittsburgh. So that's kind of interesting. Hospital, of course, not a big topic uh, this year. Yeah. <laughs> and um, now uh, your paper was uh, somewhat related to some of the more chatty versions of DNS, I want to call it. Uh, can you just uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the protocols that are involved here? Sure. Um, so the the paper was written uh, regarding the smart multi-homed name resolution Um it's not even a really a protocol. It's an optimization is how Windows refers to it. And it, it affects how name resolution protocols are handled. So link local, multicast name resolution, net BIOS, uh, those kinds of things. It, it optimizes the order in which they're uh, queried and, and also uh, which interfaces, shall we say, are used to select the, the queries. So, you know, whether it uses a, a single interface versus uh, multiple interfaces. Now, a home user may not necessarily, you know, ever use the hurt term multi-home, then you know, it's nothing to really think of. But uh, how would uh, sort of a normal workstation connect to a network end up being multi-homed uh, in, in this context? You know, in the old days, most of the time we would have a single network interface unless it was a server. But nowadays, everybody's pretty much walking around with server horsepower in their their laptops and their and their PCs. And what happens is you you have a wired connection that you can plug the the network cable into, but then you also have a wireless connection that you connect to the wireless network on. And once you have more than one network interface that is connected to a network at the same time, that becomes multi-homed because uh, you're actually connecting to two different networks at the same time. And so that's what basically classifies it as a multi-home connection. So you have your laptop, it has a wired connection and a wireless connection and a Windows system. So fairly straightforward, a home or a small business kind of setup. Uh, you don't necessarily control it uh, too tightly. You just sort of turn on and see what works kind of. You know, that's uh, what happens. How would uh, Windows pick sort of the primary interface or the interface being used then for name resolution? Right. So typically what it does is it assigns uh, priorities to the interfaces themselves. And th they have a lot of, of squiggly details that go into that. Um, some are routing related and others are just um, the overall speed and, and different things like that. So it's, it's, tr it's basically looking for what is the best connection. What's going to give me the highest performance and the best connection to, to go out to the Internet and because, I mean, Windows wants to be user friendly, right? They want you to work at the best performance as possible with the least amount of troubles from the user perspective. So um, it's, it's essentially going to put a bunch of information together and make a decision as to what has the best uh, chance of success. Now, once you're moving to a more managed network and you would like to control a little bit the, what users are using, uh, do you have any options uh, to manage a system and tell it what interface to use? So they do have several configuration options that you can use to try and manipulate. Um, for instance, you can change the priority uh, of an interface using PowerShell commands uh, as one option. And so you can tell it, hey, I want to use this one first or this one, you know, uh, this priority to this interface. And then maybe the wireless has a, uh, a higher or lower priority. And the issue with that is that by selecting the, the, the interface priority, you do get to determine which interface gets used first and foremost. But with the name resolution optimization, the, uh, the smart multi-homed <clears throat> option that's on by default, by the way, it, it, it respects that priority, but it still sends the request out every single interface regardless. So it's not saying I'm going to go out your priority interface. And if I don't get an acceptable answer back, then I'll try all the other ones because that's standard behavior. It instead says, hey, any interface you have, and that could be a VPN interface, that could be the wireless, it could be the wired. Anything that is connected to a network has a gateway. It's going to send it out. 
And um, it's going to take that and, and bring it back and wait for the answers. Now, it still respects the highest priority interface for the answer. If the answer comes back from the highest priority interface, it's going to use that answer, even if it's the last answer to come in. That's really key there uh, with the optimization is it, it doesn't care which one comes in first. That was kind of a big misconception I saw in my research. People thought, oh, it's the, it's the one that comes back first. Actually, with optimization, it's not. It respects the priority. And if you turn it off, then it takes the first answer. And that's actually kind of, kind of scary when you think about it. Yeah, so, so what are some of the risks? Yeah, so, so essentially, I think the biggest risks that come down are really uh, twofold. Uh, from a, a, a data leakage perspective, you know, if you have uh, internal corporate identities, so systems that are not publicly known, when you make a DNS query out and it goes out all interfaces, it can start to leak certain things. Like it can leak uh, system names to public DNS servers um, and of course, they're clear text. So anyone that's in that path can, can see those system names. So data leakage is one concern. The other one is um, integrity. So uh, if you're on a network that's public and open and an attacker is nearby, they can intercept and, and send a response back to redirect your traffic to them. That's one possibility. And the other one is just operational. If you're sending out internal queries to say your Comcast uh, DNS provider, they're not going to have the answer. So if it fails and you're not able to get the DNS query back that you need, you're going to have a problem where you just can't get there. It's an availability issue at that point. So the old rule networking, if something is broken, it's DNS's fault. And if it's not DNS, it's still DNS kind of. That's sort of where some of that comes from. Right. I think it's always blame the network, right? <laughs> that's the number one. That's the number one rule. Reboot three times and always blame the network. Those are the, the two primary rules. So... Your recommendation, just turn off this smart multi-home name resolution if you uh, don't really need it for any particular reason to gain more control over how DNS resolution really works? Or So my recommendation actually is, after all the testing I did, I actually found it best that leaving name resolution on is okay, actually. There's very, there's very minimal difference um, in data leakage, in my, in my opinion because of all the other things that happen on a computer system. They're very chatty. Windows is a very chatty system. Browsers are very chatty. They, they send out requests all the time. Every time you're typing in you know, addresses and stuff, they're sending them out letter by letter. So you know, th it's basically sending it out on your interfaces anyway at that point. And so, but leaving it on helps protect you because it is going to go to the preferred interface first and it's going to wait for that response to come back. So the, the better way to control it is actually leave it in on. And then uh, there's a, a set of commands that you can use that are, it involves a name resolution policy table. And this is native and it's, it's effective on any edition of windows that I've seen so far, the home edition, you know, uh, enterprise, professional, any of those Windows 10 systems, which is key because a lot of people had issues with Windows Home, uh, not having certain things like uh, group policy management. And by able to do this, you can literally just take a PowerShell command, make an NRPT rule that says, hey, I want this DNS server used for this domain. So if you have an internal domain, like example.com is your corporate domain, and you'd only want it to query your corporate domain servers. You can make a rule for that. And at that point, it doesn't matter what any of the other DNS settings are on that system. If you have five interfaces and they all have different DNS servers, doesn't matter. It's only going to use the DNS server that you specified in that NRPT rule. And that's 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 critical because first off, it scales very well. You can you can be very granular. You can do uh, subdomains, uh, fully qualified domain names, like down to the host level. You can be very granular with it, or you can wildcard it. You can say, hey, I'm just going to make a default to all DNS requests have to use this server. That's very powerful. And it's very simple to manage across an entire fleet um, of enterprise computers. So that's cool. So uh, I'll add a link uh, to your paper in the show notes so people can look up in more detail uh, how to do all of that. I understand this was the last thing you had to do for uh, this certificate or uh, what are you doing with all the free time now? Yeah, I'm a, I, that was the, the final uh, <laughs> journey on my certificate program. I'm now actually planning on uh, two things. I, 
what's next in my educational journey. Uh, I love learning. I'm a lifetime learner. And uh, I'm actually going to be creating a, a course to just kind of uh, for that targeting that person, that jack of all trades. Like when you're a small and medium sized business, you know, engineer, you tend to do a lot of things, right? You got you to have a very wide range of knowledge. And I just wanted to make something that was very introductory to all the different aspects. There's so many, such a wide aspects of, uh, of cybersecurity out there. So just like a, something to do simple for them. Well, thanks again, Rob, for joining me here. Thanks, everybody, for listening and uh, talk to you again on Monday. Bye.